Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we get started, uh, Ms. April spoke about CKC, and so that is fastly approaching. We're excited. And one thing I do want to just continue to stress to you is please make sure you do register your children. Um, we're trying to get a good head count as far as planning with food and supplies and all that kind of stuff like that. So the event, of course, is, is free. It's always free. It's just one day, July 27th. Uh, go, to the, to, go to the website, mycornerstone.me. It's, it's the first tab that you'll see on your phone or your computer. See Kids Celebration. Click that tab, and it'll take you through the sign-up. Also, if you're considering signing up to be a hero, please go ahead and do that, too, because there's some communication and stuff that we need to get out to you. I know it's easy to kind of wait around and, 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 put, and put it off until, like, the week of. Uh, but please go ahead and do that. That would be a huge benefit to us. And also, if you do know of some kids that you want to bring, again, that's really where our passion lies. We're all about dis, uh, connecting disconnected people. So do that as well. Register them. You can do that under your name. And lastly, um, we're selling uh, C-Kids shirts that go along with CKC for $5. And so you can either pay for that out here in the, uh, at the information desk or you can do that online. And if you filled out and haven't paid online, you can stop by the information desk as well. $5 per shirt per child. And that would be a big help as well. So we're in this series called The Way I See It. I think it's like week seven or six or seven or something. I don't know, but it's been great. We've been walking through the book of Mark and we learned the very first week, just kind of a quick refresh, that Mark was written by uh, an early uh, follower of Jesus, but not necessarily, uh, he wasn't one of the 12 apostles though. So there were 12, you know, 12 disciples and there were a lot of followers of Jesus. And so he was there in the early days and he followed around Peter. So he was actually kind of one of like Peter's helpers, helped out Peter and Paul. But uh, he wrote down, so Mark is a written account of Peter's sermons. So I just think that's cool. So as we're reading through these things, and of course they're written down and they've been kept through antiquity, which is awesome. But we're reading what, what, what Peter preached. And so I think that's really just cool. That explains some of its structuring. Um, but also we're walking through the story of Jesus. And so it's so good to see Jesus' story in context because it's really easy to grab little snippets throughout the Bible. And, and we're kind of all just guilty of that. I'm guilty of that even in my own reading. And I read, you know, one day here, one day there or whatever, and even in our sermons. But it's great to walk through because you actually see everything in context. and You get to see that Jesus came with a purpose. And that purpose wasn't just to die on the cross for our sins. It certainly was that. But that wasn't all. He could have wrapped that up in six months and been done. But he actually came to launch something brand new. And that brand new thing is the way in which mankind, us, relate to God. He changed the paradigm. Matter of fact, you need to know as Christian believers that the greatest event in human history has already happened. And it happened one day on a hill with three nails on a cross and then three days later an empty tomb. And so the greatest human event has already happened in human history. That's why we even have it B.C. and A.D. He literally split time in half. And so that's why we can have such hope, right? Because we're people of hope, right? Jesus has already won the day. He's already won the battle. He's already won the war. And so now we're just trying to live in that new reality as he continues to usher in his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Long intro there. Y'all caught all that? Anybody need that repeated? Can't repeat it. It was all off the top of my head anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right, so today, to get us started, I want to talk a little bit just briefly about the idea of a glass ceiling. Now, we hear this a lot in culture. Uh, generally, where you're going to hear this term is like in pay uh, gaps, pay wages or something like, you know, in this, you know, culture, maybe teachers say have a glass ceiling or maybe at your work, you feel like you have a glass ceiling, but that can kind of apply all sorts of places. It can uh, certainly apply professionally. It can reply maybe relationally, you know, the idea of that you gain or you have gone as far as you can go, but you've hit this pressure point and the whole point of a glass ceiling is you know that something's holding you back. You just don't know exactly what it is. It's kind of the same phenomenon as when you run into a glass door. You didn't know it was there, but it stops you dead anyway. Doesn't matter if you don't know it was there. Matter of fact, that's why we have stickers and plants in front of all of our glass windows and doors is because people run into them, and it's quite hilarious, but you're not supposed to laugh at that stuff at church anyway. It's really, it's really, really sad. Anyway, please don't run into our glass. So, but the idea of a glass ceiling, another idea to put this is like a plateau. And so I, I think a good way to even illustrate this is like, let's say like dieting. So if you've ever uh, started dieting, it's oftentimes comes really easy at first, right? Because why? You cut out the very obvious things like Krispy Kreme is no longer an option when you're on a diet, right? Or at least any diet that's worth anything. If your diet says you can have Krispy Kreme, I wouldn't follow that diet. So, but it's easy because you can see the donuts there, right? But as you begin to lose weight, you begin to plateau out. And so the same input that you were giving no longer gives you the same results. And so in those first two weeks, maybe you were losing weight. And it was exciting to get on the scale. But you're still doing all the same things. 
You may not even be cheating on your diet. You may be doing the same workouts that you've been doing, but you hit a plateau or you hit a glass ceiling. Something is keeping you where you are, and what happens is the further you push along into things, the harder it becomes to identify the glass ceiling, a ceiling like with a season. Because like with food, it could be in stuff like the seasoning or, man, I'm eating nothing but salads. Now, granted, I drown it in dressing, and this guy's full of calories, but they're hidden calories, right? I'm not eating donuts. Why is the ceiling still above me? And so you have to look harder to identify what's holding you back. So that can happen professionally, relationally, physically, financially. There can be glass ceilings. And one of the most frustrating glass ceilings, and what we're talking about today, is a spiritual glass ceiling. It's that place where we can get and, and I'm sure many of you maybe have felt there that you were following God and you were, you were doing maybe what you've always done and in the past it was enough. But for this new challenge, this new season, new place you are in life, it's like you're hitting a glass ceiling. And you're, you're almost like you're being asked of something. God is asking you maybe to do something or endure something or go through something or to talk to someone or whatever, but you don't have what it takes to pull it off because you feel like you've plateaued, you've hit a glass ceiling. Even though nothing may be even be wrong necessarily, it's easy to just feel like you have, you've stopped growing. And the reason I want to talk about this is I've experienced this, may, no, many of you have, that if you, if you sit at a, on a plateau or if you sit at that pressure point under a glass ceiling long enough, you, you can stand it for a while, right? Because even like with the diet, what, what happens, let's be logical, what happens? You're dieting, you're doing well, you hit a plateau, but you're not where you want to be. There are only two options because you're not going to stay there for long. Either A, you're going to double down, become more miserable, right? Give up more stuff, work out harder, or you're going to say, this is no longer worth it, and you're going to recant, and you're going to go back to what you were doing, right? Isn't that what we do? We, we can't stay at that place of tension. We're not really meant to stay there. And so what happens spiritually is that we can get to a point that's a pressure point where we feel like, I know I'm not where I want to be, but for some reason, I can't move on from this spot. There seems to be something holding me back, holding me down. And so you can maybe stay there for a little while, but eventually the pressure will become too much. So either A, you'll have to push forward, which is what I want you to do today. I'm, I want to both challenge and encourage you today. Or you will say, this isn't worth it. I'm going to do things my way. And I think a lot of times we choose option B. Because option B is easier, because breaking through a glass ceiling, they're called glass ceilings for a reason. They're difficult to push through. It doesn't just happen on good wishes and, and positive energy. It happens by being specific and by following some stuff. So what we want to do is I'm going to walk through, and so today's, uh, today's message is about this, how to break through a spiritual glass ceiling. So we're continuing the book of Mark. Let's start reading Mark 10. I want to read this whole story. It's not very long. Many of you have heard this before. Um, we're going to talk about it afterwards, what I want you to kind of do with it. So let's just read this through uh, together. Mark 10, verses 17 through 22. As he, Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What a good question, right? Like, that's a big question. Isn't that the kind of questions we should be asking Jesus? Like, wouldn't it be funny? Like, Jesus! What's the best place to get gas for my car? Well, how do I have inter inherit eternal life? Verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. And this is kind of a statement. We're not going to go into this about um, Jesus kind of claiming his deity. He's always really vague. But uh, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. And then he starts naming off some commandments. Most of us would probably even know these. Hopefully also follow these. Do not murder. A great commandment to follow, by the way, if you want to have friends or relatives or not be in jail. Uh, do not commit adultery. Also, if you want to have friends. Uh, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And so the guy, like many of us, if I tick that off, I'm assuming that you're here and nobody's chasing you. All of us would be like, boom. Problem solved. Heaven, here I come, right? Express lane. And he said to the teacher, Teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. Good news, everybody. Well, I have just figured out this age-old problem because everybody, of course, wants to know back then and today, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I get into the kingdom of God in the, in the age to come? And then looking at him, he says in verse 21, Jesus loved him and said, You lack one thing. <laughs> is it, is it uh, Price is Right? I should have got this right first. Service. Bum, bum, ba, bum. You know, when everybody lost their money, right? You know, like everybody's like, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire. 
you lack one thing. Uh oh. Go sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Now, I gotta be honest with you, this is one of those verses you're like, boy, I wish Jesus could have been a little less specific because, um, holy cow, right? But here's the thing I do wanna point out just something you'd grab onto while, we, while we're here, is that Jesus never gives a challenge without a promise. He never gives a challenge without a promise. The world gives you challenges and no promises, but Jesus also gives you challenges with promises. So you can follow the world, which is still going to be full of challenges, and most of the challenges are going to break you, they're going to bind you up, they're going to crush you, they're going to leave you stranded, but Jesus never does any of those things. He gives you challenge always with a promise. And so you can always know, because he is the eternal promise keeper, that if you accept his challenge, you're also accepting his promises. Anyway, I thought that will preach, man. Y'all are dead today. Jeez, what's coming on? I'll, I'll, I'll preach up here by myself. I don't care. Whatever. Go with all you have to the poor and you have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. Verse 22. But he was dismayed by this demand. Wouldn't we all? And he went away grieving because he had many possessions. So a little bit of context here. First, I know and I realize most of us have probably heard this story before. This is generally titled The Rich Young Ruler. Uh, it's found in Mark and in Luke. And so many of you have probably heard this preached before. If you spend any kind of time in church, you've probably read this yourself by reading through the Gospels at some point in your life. Uh, and generally, especially because the following conversation tends to lean a little bit to, to, to money right after this, but then Jesus dispels that. This story is not about money. Don't sit in here and go, yes, finally, one for the rich folks. Cha-ching, don't have to listen today. Good old preacher. No, this is for all of us. This is for everybody because we live, whether you realize it or not, whether you feel like it or not, in a wealthy, possession-filled, materialistic world. None of you came in with junky clothes on because all of us, to some degree or another, find value in the things that we have, that we surround ourselves with. We live in this world of possessions. But it's not even just about possessions. Because sometimes we might not have a lot of physical possessions, but we hoard our possessions of feelings, whether that's, whether that's anger or bitterness or jealousy or, or negativity. You know, we can hoard things. We can have a lot of possessions in a lot of different areas because the disciples actually following the story, is quite interesting, have a crisis of faith because they realize what Jesus is saying applies to everyone, not just to this one man. And the reality is we all find ourselves here. You just might not be asked to give up your possessions, but Jesus does ask you to give up something. All of us. But always remember, he never gives a challenge without a promise. Never does. So, context. Who is this guy? I generally think he was a good guy. I think it's easy to read into this that he's some snobby uh, person that just wants the easy road. And if, if we say that about him, then we're going to have to say that about us because I really want the easy road. I really, really do. I really want the path of less resistance. I know you do too because we live in that culture. That's why we love things like Twitter and maybe not just the program, but that's why we love even inspirational sayings. That's why we want to be fed stuff all the time that makes us feel good in the moment with doing the least amount of work, right? That's why, going back to dieting, what would be the best invention ever besides the cure for cancer? A pill that makes you skinny without having to diet. Amen? Amen. Why? Because I want the easy road and so do you. We all do. And so does this guy. And so I think he's asking a genuine question. And if Jesus left it there, I think all of us would be, party over here. Why? Because that would sound so great. So I think he was devout. I think he genuinely wanted to know. I think he was reverent to Jesus. I think he was interested in this new teacher with this new way of, of relating to God. And he was wealthy. Don't know how he got his wealth. But all we know is that it was something vitally important to him. And so I think we can even make a quick uh, connection that your wealth lies where you put value in your life. Because maybe it isn't money, but you know you really do value maybe your name or your talent or your looks or whatever. Maybe even your children is whatever you put a bunch of value and emphasis on. And they're not bad things. Money's not a bad thing. Money can do a tremendous amount of good things for the kingdom of God. So can relationships. So can children. But anything put into the place of worship, anything that becomes more valuable than following Jesus, is ultimately a chain. So what I want to do today, he had hit a spiritual ceiling. This guy had hit a spiritual ceiling. And Jesus gave him what he needed to break through. So powerful in this story. So three ways. I don't know why it's always three. I don't know. 
I guess because two seems too less and four is like, geez, shut up, right? So three is like the right number, I guess. I don't know. Number one, number one way to break through a spiritual glass ceiling, stop holding on to what is holding you back. Stop holding on to what is holding you back. Let's start back at verse 19. Just kind of follow along on the side screens here. You know the commandments, Jesus says. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And do not defraud. Honor your father and mother, he said to him. And then he said, teacher, I have done all of these from my youth. And then Jesus continued, go and sell all you have. Jump down and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. See, I think what's so crucial to see here is that Jesus first points to very visible things that would have direct consequences socially for this young man and asked if he was following those things. Because generally when we want to know how am I doing, it's what other people can see, right? And so it's so funny how Jesus starts there. He goes, okay, let's look at the things that I know you're probably doing because I could just sum up. Like I don't even have to use my, my, my God power right now, right, to even sum up. I'm sure you're doing these things. And, of course, the guy's like, yes, of course. Why? Because just in his day as it is in ours, we value other people's opinions and perspectives. Correct? Matter of fact, church people, you and I, most of us, if you're not a church person, you don't have to include yourself here, but if you have been in church in any amount of time, We, like him, have learned how to look it even if we're not living it, right? Because why? These are really big things. You know, no, I have not murdered anybody. I have thought about it on numerous occasions, but kudos to me for not following through, right? I honor my mom and dad. I don't cheat on stuff or whatever right we're just such good people because why we live in a culture of good people this is expected but here's the problem people that don't even believe in a god much less our god do the same thing too so that that can't be the standard right that can't be it and so jesus names this stuff out i could probably almost i mean i could feel it in this guy's soul because why when i ask myself Am I really following Jesus like I'm supposed to? You know what I go to? I generally go to things that other people can see. Not to the things that only God can see. He may have even been very generous with his money. I don't know. We don't know. But it's interesting that Jesus went to the things quickly that would be considered, well, of course he's going to do that well. The good parts of our life. But here's the thing. Jesus always goes deeper. Jesus always goes deeper, and he will always show you things that you can't see yourself. Matter of fact, uh, I think a good illustration would be your heart, your spiritual heart, your spiritual mind is like a cavern, and we're walking around with a, with a candle oftentimes, and we only see the things that we really want to see that are lurking in our heart, which is why sometimes when somebody pokes or prods you the wrong way, have you ever noticed how sometimes something can almost jump out of you that you never knew was there? Or you can look back on a situation and in a weird way, you remember making the decision, but you even think, I never thought I would have done that. But given the right situation, the circumstance, you need to know, we need to know, we're capable of anything. We are self-preservationists to the core. And luckily, we just often pat our lives around so we know what not to do. But given the opportunity, we're not naturally just that good. It's often the expectations of other people that keep us in line, isn't it? That shouldn't be right, though, because who sees our heart? So what God does, what Jesus does, is he illuminates the entire cavern. So when he steps into your life, and that's why sometimes it is It's hard. It's hard following Jesus. It's great because there's always a promise with the challenge. But what he does is he begins to illuminate things that we never thought were our problems. I can't tell you how many times I've said, no, I don't struggle with that, only then to realize, oh, I struggle with that. I can be quite, what I think, humble. I'm kind of a self-effacing, laid-back guy. But I can't tell you how much pride has kept me from things or thinking a certain way about things or thinking about myself a certain way. Why? I wouldn't have said I'm a prideful person because why? We have what we think is an outward pride. But listen here, your heart struggles with pride. Most of us do. But it's hidden. So here's the only way to have the, the cave illuminated is this. The only way to know what is holding you back 
is by spending time with Jesus. Well, here we go again, preacher. Well, you're right. Where did this guy have to go? He had to go to Jesus, right? And so Jesus sometimes often starts with the simple things. And I think that's what's so good about our faith. Jesus doesn't ask you to change everything overnight. And he kind of established a baseline with this guy. Check, 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 check. Good job, man. Now, because I see you, because I can really see you, young man, there's something holding you back and you don't even know it. You have to spend time with Jesus in order to know what is holding you back. So what are some examples? You know what can be holding you back? It can be a, it can be a habit. A, a, a habitual sin is probably even a better way to put that. A habitual sin that doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, but that's constantly holding you back. I'll point one out for the guys because I am a guy. I'll tell you one that is constantly lurking and basically every male that I know is lust. And here's the thing. Lust isn't something that everybody can see generally, is it? No, because we're decent human beings and of course we only keep that stuff in our mind. But that kind of thought pattern can lead you to not following God because you're constantly allowing something else to speak and lord over your life. It's hidden though, isn't it? Nobody knows that. You can be married and nobody even knows that because why? It's hidden. Ladies, you, you have, you have things. I mean, maybe it's even like a, for any of us, a negative spirit. We talked about that last week. A negative spirit is a fake killer. Anger removes the voice of the Lord in your life. If you're perpetually angry, and maybe you have every right to be, or at least you think so, because what they did to you was so unfair, and it probably was. But the same God who was unjustly crucified for your sake does tell us to forgive too. And he doesn't say that because I did, now you have to. He says because it will crush you. Anger will crush you. Lust will crush you. Negativity and gossip will crush you. It always leads to chaos and it always leads to death. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it will kill things. Sin always kills things. Sin always separates. We talk about that all the time. The only way to know what is holding you back is by spending time with Jesus. Maybe it's thought patterns. Maybe it's people. <laughs> Finally, yes, I knew it. My wife, my spouse. No, no, that is not it. But there are sometimes negative people in your life that you need to at least even for a season you need to shut them down because they're constantly speaking a truth to you that is contrary to what the word of God is trying to tell you what the spirit is trying to translate to you and you're constantly going to hit that glass ceiling because when you need somebody to speak hope they're speaking death people around you are very powerful and you know what guys I, I mean, I'll be honest I don't have it up here with me but you know one of the things that that honestly holds me back sometimes and it's just such a simple stupid thing but it's my phone Every time I have to go to do like my quiet time or study, I have to put it, make a point to put it down. Why? Because I'm so conditioned to just want to waste time. And you know what's funny? This just shows you, shows you, shows you, and I'll put myself out there. I don't care. I can sit there and waste 30 minutes looking at nonsense on Facebook and the news, but struggle to spend 10 minutes praying and reading the Bible. Why is that? It's because our hearts are tuned naturally by sin to want to resist God's wisdom and direction. That's why you must force it to. You don't want to do it naturally. Just like a kid doesn't want to eat its vegetables, it wants sugar and snacks. But you know what? It rots teeth out, and so will that other stuff rots your heart. Isn't it funny, though? Isn't it funny? And so maybe the thing holding you back isn't some grand sin, some big secret. It may be. But maybe it's just simple patterns that you've developed that just waste time instead of spending time. It could be television, all sorts of conveniences we have in our life. So stop holding on to what is holding you back. In the end, I will not stand before my Savior and say, Lord, but that Facebook video was so funny. <laughs> and sometimes there are. They're hilarious. But that's not what it's going to hold. Number two, let go to grow. It rhymes. Isn't that good? Man, I worked hard on that one. Anyway, it came to me literally last night in my sleep. Anyway, let go to grow. Verse 21, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. So I want to give you a, a visible illustration of this because I think this is a powerful concept and I can talk a lot and really fast. So I want to ask Gary to come out here. Y'all give a hand to Gary North. <laughs> Gary helps lead our Hill uh, College Ministry. Gary's also one of the strongest people I know, so he's gonna, he decided to help me uh, with this. So Gary, Gary's going to represent us, obviously. So in here, I have a, a box of goodies. And so what I did last night, and I need something kind of bulky 
Um, and so I went and raided my kid's bedroom and sold all their stuffed animals. And so, uh, Gary, I need you to hold here. This is uh, either Bingo or Rolly. I'm not entirely sure here. Here's the other one, whichever that one that one is. So, Gary, if you can hold this one. Have a little dinosaur. Like, rah, right? Red dinosaur. Have a little curious George monkey here. Have a, oh, it's me, Mickey Mouse, right? And uh, then we got uh, Paw Patrol, Patrol. Any, like, kid parents in here? Some of y'all are like, I hate all of those things. I hate all of them. Then we have a, a Dumbo pillow. And to top it all off here, I have uh, a giant lamb, right? Isn't that, like, so Bible, right? The lamb of God. Anyway. All right. So now Gary's really strong. All right. He works out. I kind of want to be Gary when I grow up. But right now, Gary is like a lot of us. Matter of fact, he's like all of us before, before Jesus, okay? We're all carrying around all this stuff that is, to, to, to the ultimate end, pointless, but to us, extremely valuable. But right now, if I were to ask Gary, hey, Gary, you want to go throw the baseball a little bit? Gary is incapable of doing anything. Regardless of how strong he is, he's, he's too overburdened with all of this unnecessary stuff. And that's exactly how we are when we come to Jesus. We're just carrying so much stuff. And I know we're making light of it, but some of the stuff that we're carrying is heavy stuff. It's childhood stuff. It's stuff that was handed to us. It's decisions that we've made that we regret that we never want anybody to know about. We're walking into relationships and marriages. Sometimes some of us, because we never put our stuff down, we're actually taking the stuff and handing it to our kids. Whole nother thing. But we're just carrying so much useless stuff. And this isn't life abundantly, is it? If Gary had to live like this all the time, what would all of you be saying? Gary, just put it down. Gary, just drop it. It's not going to hurt. It's not going to hurt the floor. It's not going to hurt the lamb. It's not going to hurt anything. Just drop it, right? And that's what God is telling us. Please just come to me. My burden is light. And so when we step into a relationship with Jesus, he does. He begins to remove things. But you know what he begins to remove, though? It's often the most, it's the visible things. Because this story that we're talking about today, this rich young ruler, this story plays out all our lives. Like there's an initial time, just like him, when God, when Jesus is like, listen, you need to lay it down and follow me. And the beautiful thing is he doesn't require us to, to drop everything all at one time. He just wants us to drop the things that are really holding us down. And so, you know what? Boom. Lammy is gone. Dumbo, which I didn't really care for the sequel or the newest one, was gone, right? And as you begin to live life, what's so beautiful, and so many of us have experienced, and if you haven't experienced this, man, you were missing out. God begins to free us from all of these things that used to be so big. They blocked up our vision of what God wanted for our future. And we can begin to have big faith and dream big dreams. And we can hear the voice of God. And we continue to drop things and, and drop things. And then, you know what, we kind of get down to, I'm going I'm to leave you just with two things here. And so this is really what I want to focus on today. Now, now here's the thing. At this point, Gary is now actually kind of capable. I, a matter of fact, I think, because Gary, you, you, have, you have kids, right? You've even gotten used to the, to the one hold, you know, one arm thing where you can basically do like everything. Like it's crazy when your parents, how much you can do with only one arm, right? Because you're always holding, especially you moms. Y'all are incredible. Y'all can like cook a five course meal, you know, write a song. And I don't know, you like sew a dress and all that all while holding the kid. It's incredible. It's nuts how y'all can do that stuff, right? And so we can actually get really used to living this way. And I would even say we can get quite content. Because the problem is all of these really big visible things in a way, are easier to deal with. But where the glass ceiling begins and what God so desperately wants for you and me is not to just give up most things, but all those things. All those things that you still deem valuable and important and they're not, or maybe they're not valuable, important. maybe they're unforgivable. Maybe in a weird way that hurt defines you. Maybe that thing that happened or that decision you made defines you. And you can give God all these other things, but not those. Not those. And you can even begin to, to kind of justify, well, God, I'm still quite capable. I can still do what I need to do. I got one free arm. I can do and get whatever. I can be faithful with this. And God says, no, I need you faithful in all things. Don't just hold on to these few things. And so do you have the trust? Matter of fact, do you have the courage that's what sometimes it takes because these things, remember the cavern, remember, the, the, remember the, the cave, these things are often lurking somewhere deep. 
These are the things that maybe you didn't even know about yourself that only the Holy Spirit can reveal to your heart. Now, other people may know them about you because sometimes these things come out onto the people that we care about the most, but we can't see them. I can take those back. Y'all give me a hand. Thank y'all. So here's the thing. This is a continual process that happens all our life, and sometimes the hardest things to give up are the things that seem so small. And here's a good indicator, and I think this is so powerful, because what did it say? It says, but he was dismayed, verse 22, he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving. That's so big, because he had many possessions. If it doesn't make you grieve, then it may not be the right thing. Because you know what I do? I know you probably do it too. I bargain. I bargain. Lord, if you do this, then I will. Or Lord, this can't change, so will you do this anyway? And so we begin to kind of work it out with God because why? Sometimes when you give something up, it will feel like a death. And you know, maybe, I don't want to be too specific because we all are going to have something. We're all going to be holding on to something, and that's why this is so powerful. Don't think that the rich young ruler's story only applies to those entering the kingdom. It's those trying to work their way through life in sanctification and redemption too. It's our story. It is our story. And sometimes the smallest things become the most difficult things. If it doesn't make you grieve, then it may not be the right thing. And here's what breaks God's heart, and I've seen this play out. It's when someone, I've I've seen it, I'm going to try to paint a picture again. When someone really just has their heart lit on fire for the Lord. And it's something powerful and amazing to watch. And what happens in any relationship, what hap- is, is, is there's a greater sense of intimacy that continues to grow, right? Who, how I know my wife now is different than it was when I first married her, but also when it was five years ago. We've been married nine years now. And so I continue to learn more about her. And some of that's because life changes us. And so we're constantly relearning each other under new circumstances. I didn't know her as a mother when we got married, but now I know her as a mother. You see how that changes, and so our life begins to change, and we're constantly learning and knowing God in different ways because life throws different things at us. And so as that fire burns in a person, they hit the ceiling, and they can't take the pressure. And to be honest, this isn't trying to make it sound depressing, but to be honest, many of us aren't willing to do what it takes to break through. We just back up. And backing up's never the way. You can't stay on the plateau forever. You can't just stay okay forever because God's calling you to relationship. If your relationship never changes, then I want to say maybe it's not that strong of a relationship. So here's the question. How much is your freedom worth? It costs Jesus everything. It's funny that we're not willing hard to give up anything. Let it grow, or let, let go to grow, let go to grow. Number three, got to hurry. Know that Jesus is always for your good. Step three, know that Jesus is always, know that Jesus is always, know that Jesus is always for your good. Verse 21, looking at him, this is so strong, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. You know, I was brought up with angry Jesus. I don't know what your background is. Many of you maybe weren't brought up with Jesus at all, or maybe you were brought up with like super like hippie Jesus or something. There's a lot of versions of Jesus out there. There's only one Jesus. Lots of versions of him, though, they get it wrong. Honestly, I was kind of brought up with angry Jesus. And what angry Jesus means is that when I read this verse, he was snarky, kind of a, a gotcha Jesus. And so you can kind of read it that way. Well, teacher, I have done all of these things. Well, you lack one thing, wise guy, right? And so if you begin to breathe that into yourself, you know what? You don't want to come to that kind of Jesus. You want to go pray to that kind of Jesus like, help me, right? You know, you don't want that kind of Jesus. No. Jesus is not angry. He is compassionate. You don't die on the cross for someone because you're angry. You die on the cross for them because you're broken. And so we need to be careful not to breathe maybe an incorrect background into some of these stories. Jesus looked at him and his heart broke. Why? Because he knew that in all of his trying, he was still missing the entire point. God wasn't something to be achieved. He was someone to know. 
And this young guy, with all of his wealth and all of his friends and all of his do-gooder mentality, didn't even know God when he was standing right in front of him. This is the only story in the New Testament, by the way, that shows you how powerful this is. This is the only story in the New Testament when Jesus specifically asked someone to follow him, and they turned around and walked away. You can be standing in a way in front of the truth and the life and what you're holding is so much more important to you that you can turn around and walk away. And we need to own that. We need to know that both as non-believers, if you're standing in that seat and you're still trying to make a decision, or whether as believers, because you know what? We can still get to a point where like Jesus, it is not worth it anymore. There were those that followed Jesus that walked away because they got to a point where like, this isn't worth the cost. What's the cost worth to you? But Jesus is always for your good. You know how we know that? Because we love this verse here, and this is so powerful and so true. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, say all things. All things God works together for the what? The, the good. He works for the good. His challenge always comes with a promise. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He always works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. God doesn't ask something of you that he has not already given. He's not going to go someplace that he is not already gone. That's what's so powerful about our faith. Every other faith system says you must do, you must perform, you must make it. And if you don't, so sorry, bad luck for you. But Jesus says, no, I was in the boat in the storm. I was in the fire with Shadrach, Reshach, and Abednego. I was there. I was the one on the cross for you. Wow, what was your freedom worth? Everything. It's always been worth everything for him. So what is your freedom worth? Know that Jesus is always for your good. If you think that he's taking to be petty, you'll never follow a Jesus like that. But good news, that Jesus isn't real. The real Jesus bled out, but three days later powerfully walked out of a hole in a rock, victorious forever. Why did he do that? Is because it was for our good. So are you sitting at a place where you feel the tension that you have hit a glass ceiling? You, have, you know, some of you, man, I think you're kind of walking around. You've got some bumps on your head, right? You've got some, you know, you got some goose eggs on your head because you've been hitting this thing a couple times. And let me tell you something. I want to both encourage you, but I want to challenge you that if you stay bumping your head, you know what? Sooner or later, you're going to get a headache and you're going to stop. Let Jesus illuminate the parts of your life that you're scared to let him to so he can show you what's holding you back. Don't hold on to those things. Let go to grow. And finally, always, always, always trust to know that he's always working for my good. It may not feel like it. My kid loves chocolate. And you know what? He can't have it for supper. Why? Because I love him. I want, I want to work together for his good, right? Because I want him to have teeth when he's an adult. And I don't want him to have diabetes at six years old. We can have, you know, I mean, I know it's for his good, right? He's always working for your good. But can you trust him? Here's the thing. Do I trust Jesus enough to let go of what is holding me back? That's a question we need to ask all the time. It's not an issue of love because you can love someone and not trust them. Again, I love my kids, but I don't trust him with everything because he's a child. But do I trust Jesus enough to let go of what's holding the best. I want you guys to stand. We're going to close. Please nobody moving around. We're going to get out of here on time. Mostly on time. This is a, this is a, a powerful, important moment, so please don't be dis disrespectful of that. With everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed, I always want to, as much as I can, get this opportunity. If you have been standing at the ledge and you feel like your glass ceiling is stepping into relationship for the first time with Jesus and you've either maybe never, never prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior or maybe you did many years ago, but you didn't even know what it meant or you didn't mean it. It was just something in the moment. Well, now let's change that. The greatest event in human history has already happened. It's happened for your sake. And God is always working together for your good. Matter of fact, I would say he's the sole person in the universe that actually knows what you're good at and is actively working towards it. And so he invites you to partner and connect with him. And so if you've never done that, I want us all to pray together because I don't want anybody to feel like an outsider. And I want us all to pray together. And if you declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, he says that he is faithful to forgive us and to save us. You can repeat after me. Say, Jesus. I believe in you. I want to trust you. So help me to trust you. Forgive me 
and save me today. In Jesus' name. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time and you, and you meant it, I'd love for you to quickly raise your hand. I'm not trying to pinpoint you, but there's something about the physical movement that, that, that kind of concretes a, a, something that happened in the mind. So on three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Raise your hand up all over the room. That is so powerful. Thank you so much. You can put your hands down now. So many people making decisions. Lord, let's give them a, a praise clap. That is incredible. Change is happening in amongst our midst. You just made a decision that will radically change your life forever, not just in this life, but in the age to come. And if you allow him to, he will continue to grow you and make you into who you were actually created to be. You were created on purpose for purpose. So if you would like to have any information, we'd love to connect with you at the information desk or just stop me or one of the pastors up by the front doors. We always try to stay there and uh, be available. So for the rest of us, do I trust Jesus enough to let go what is holding me back? Let's pray. Jesus, King Jesus, Savior Jesus, compassionate Jesus, thank you so much that we have these stories, that we can see where your heart is, and that we can see that even though you do give us challenges, that you always back it up with a promise, and promises that far outweigh, that are far more beneficial than anything that we could ever gain or keep or hold on to ourselves. So this morning, as we sing this, Lord, as we declare your promises and your truth, strengthen our hearts, illuminate the dark parts of our hearts, Lord, so that we may better serve you, not just for ourselves, but for our families, our city, our country, in Jesus' name. Amen.